to see you here this morning. I know it's uh, some, sometimes difficult uh, to get here on a Wednesday morning. Uh, the fact that we're being fed afterwards always helps me. <laughs> I always think that's a wonderful bonus. Worth coming, especially with the food we've had. My goodness. And uh, today you have corned beef and hash, or corned beef and cabbage. No hash. No, it's corned beef and cabbage. And I have been back there, and I have looked at it, and it looks good. So you're in for a treat. We are uh, continuing our, uh, really, study of the body of Christ. Uh, first Wednesday, Ash Wednesday, we looked at his feet. Uh, last week, we looked at his hands. This week, we looked at Christ's eyes, and eyes full of compassion, eyes full of love especially for us who are sinners, which is all of us. So uh, we will continue that as we go through Lent, and uh, we want to celebrate and also hopefully be inspired to uh, walk closer with Jesus as a result of what we learn. So let's begin this morning with our opening hymn, Jesus, Refuge of the Weary. on the outward appearance, O God, but you look on the heart. Your eye, O Lord, is on those who revere you, on those who hope in your steadfast love. Lord, you see how evil are our deeds and how wicked are our ways, but we confess to you our sin and ask for your mercy and forgiveness. Your eye, O Lord, is on those who revere you, on those who hope in your steadfast love. Lord, you have not only forgiven sins, but you have also given new eyes to the blind, that the works of God might be clear to us. Your eye, O Lord, is on those who revere you, on those who hope in your steadfast love. Lord, we so easily see the speck in our neighbor's eyes, but are blind to the log in our own. Give us new sight to view neither their sins nor our own, but rather to see their righteousness and ours through your holiness. Your eyes, O Lord, are upon the righteous, and your ears are open to their prayer.
Our first lesson this morning is from 1 Samuel chapter 16, beginning with verse 1. Um, I think many of you know that the Israelites were seeking a king to lead them, that judges had, had ruled over them, if you want to say ruled, but had guided them for many years, but they were watching their neighbors and they decided, well, we should have a king like they do. And so this reading is about, somewhat about that. The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you grieve over Saul since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord and invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me him whom I declare to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. And the elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, do you come peaceably? And he said, peaceably. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. This is the word of the Lord. The Lord looks down from heaven. He sees all humankind. Where he sits enthroned, he watches all the inhabitants of the earth, he who fashions the hearts of them all, and observes all their deeds. Truly, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love, to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and shield. Our heart is glad in him because we trust in his holy name. The second lesson for today is from 1 Peter chapter 3, beginning with verse 8. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless, for to this you are called, that you may obtain a blessing. For whoever desires to love life and see good days let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil <clears throat> and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. This is the word of the Lord. my Redeemer lives, and at last he will stand upon the earth, and after my skin has been thus destroyed, then from my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see on my side, 
and my eyes shall behold and not another. Please rise for the Holy Gospel this morning, taken from the ninth chapter of the Gospel of John. As Jesus passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, Jesus spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, It is he. Others said, No, but he is like him. He kept saying, I am the man. So they said to him, Then how were your eyes opened? He answered, The man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and received my sight. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated as we sing our sermon hymn, My Faith Looks Up to Thee. As Jesus was passing by, he saw a man who was sightless from birth. When the eyes of Christ saw his blindness, he had compassion on him. Many of our Lord's healings 
began with Jesus simply seeing the need with the compassionate eyes of Christ. Jesus often responded without even being asked, simply because the love in the eyes of Christ prompted him to act. When the widow of Nain was burying her son, Jesus saw her and had compassion on her and raised her son to life. When Jesus entered Peter's house, he saw Peter's mother-in-law lying sick with a fever, and he healed her. Yes, the eyes of Christ often saw the malady and responded with sympathy, tenderness, and understanding by initiating the forgiveness of sins and healing of the affliction. The eyes of Christ saw much misery, and he responded with concern, mercy, when Jesus saw the crowds, he said, I have compassion for them, for they are harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. For our meditation today, we will consider the miracles of love and grace that resulted from what the eyes of Christ saw. To do that, perhaps we can think about the eyesight of Jesus as if it were our own. Our eyesight is a great gift from God. People who have the full use of all five of the physical senses generally acknowledge that if they lost any one sensory perception, they would miss their eyesight the most. So much that we love what comes to us through our eyes. With our eyes, we see the beauty of a sunrise and the splendor of a sunset. We recognize the vastness of the night sky, filled with sparkling stars. We look upon the delicate beauty of a flower bathed in morning dew. These are the things the eyes of Christ saw also. With our eyes, we enjoy the satisfaction of a task completed after much effort, the pleasure of a job well done. Our eyes behold the smiles of our loved ones. They watch with delight the friskiness of a new baby colt frolicking in a field. Our eyes shine with elation at the ruggedness of a view from a mountain top. These are the things the eyes of Christ saw also. We gaze with joy upon the fresh green of new grass on the hills in spring. We behold the fury and power of a storm. We witness the wonder of the hush that comes over a baby as it sleeps in the arms of a parent. These are the things the eyes of Christ saw also. Our eyes savor the sight of a sparkling stream of diamonds as water in a brook tumbles over rocks in the sunshine. With our eyes we ponder the calm stillness of a fog as a mist clings to the trees. Our sight gives us the cheerfulness of a fire shared with a circle of friends. These are the things that the eyes of Christ saw also. The eyes of Christ saw the same variety of beauty that our eyes see. But they also saw the same ugliness and violence that our, that our eyes see. The eyes of Christ saw the hate and rejection of brothers and sisters for one another. Jesus recognized the cruelty that pent-up hate can unleash on someone. His eyes discerned the dishonesty, deception, and deceitfulness of people. They beheld the squalor and filthiness of the poor whom he loved. The eyes of Christ observed the selfishness and pride of the rich, and he loved them too. Yet the eyes of Christ were able to see more than the transitory and frail objects that our eyes see, to look beyond this temporary world to the kingdom of God. Jesus proclaimed, those who see me, see the one who sent me. All who have seen me have seen the Father. Even as he was crucified, as he saw the soldiers dividing his garments, and saw 
his mother's grief, he still could see the value of each person there. He saw them as children of God to the end, for he said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. When you and I are faced with difficult decisions and struggling with some serious situation we find ourselves in, perhaps we can remember how the eyes of Christ saw his tormentors. We could ask ourselves, what would the eyes of Christ see in this dilemma? When we see those who oppose us or dislike us, we could ask, how would the eyes of Christ see this person? We do need to see more clearly, not with our self-orientated eyes, but with the new eyes of Christ. We need to see Jesus dying on the cross for us. Because when we see him on the cross, we are seeing God the Father. When we see the eyes of Christ closing in agony, we see the love of God. When we see Christ bleeding and dying, we see the power of righteousness over sin. When we see the eyes of Christ closed in the darkness of death and the tomb, we see the power of love over hate. When we see the eyes of Christ opened in the resurrection, we see the power of life over death. For Jesus has promised that the eyes of Christ will look upon us again. You have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. Amen. Let us rise for the prayer of Let us pray for the whole body of Christ and for all people according to their needs, for all the nations of the world, that their leaders may see with your eyes of justice and mercy the needs of their people, especially in the situation in Ukraine. For this, let us pray to the Lord. For this congregation, that in seeing the poor, the hungry, the oppressed, and the grieving, we may see you in them and welcome our opportunity to serve you. Let us pray to the Lord. For all who are blind, either physically or spiritually, that you may be seen by them as the light of the world, let us pray to the Lord. For the sick, especially for the members of this congregation and our many visitors, for those we love, those we name in our hearts who are in need of healing of body, soul, or spirit, that we may see the fulfillment of your kingdom through the healing that comes by your power, let us pray to the Lord. O Lord, mercy. Into your care, O Lord, we entrust all for whom we pray, believing in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord.
kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his loving eyes upon you and give you peace. Amen. Please be seated for our final hymn. I decided that I wanted to celebrate Luther. And uh, <clears throat> my motto was, why should the uh, Irish have all the fun? <clears throat> Since they have St. Patrick's Day. So I decided that the second Wednesday in November was St. Luther's Day. And so the congregation got behind it and we had a, a Luther German Fest uh, meal that we invited the uh, uh, community to. And at that time, there was a Roman Catholic priest who didn't take too kindly to the fact that I had declared Luther a saint. So he called me and said, you know, Luther isn't a saint. I said, well, who says Luther isn't a saint? Well, he said, it's not in the Catholic Book of Saints. I said, well, Luther will never be in the Catholic Book of Saints. And uh, we have declared him to be so, and thus it is. <laughs> So we celebrated St. Luther's Day, the second Wednesday of every, no every November thereafter. And they're still doing it today. So St. Luther's Day. It may be something you want to think about, right? Second Wednesday of November, St. Luther's Day. Should, why should the Irish have all the fun? That's what I said. <laughs> uh, we are, I think, ready. Are we not? I don't see anybody in the kitchen. Uh, I'd like to get a high sign from them before I send you in there. Judy? Ah. Are we ready? Oh, not quite. No, I've, I've said all I'm going to say this morning. Thank you, Dale, uh, for being the other voice. I'm sure you figured that out pretty quickly. Uh, but uh, anyway, anyone? Well, uh, okay, who's got Irish blood? No one? Really? Oh, my, that's interesting. You're all German. Yeah, and Germans never have any. 